Jacob Meach. I'm from the Minnesota State University, Matt Cato. And my mentors were uh, Tom and Rick. Um, overview of this presentation, because me and Alex were doing the same research at NTF, um, I'm going to just give you a brief introduction into the Z-Pinch and how that, a little bit about how that works, and then a little bit about our can canisters that we use to collect our data. Um, our main goal in our, in our research was to um, map, map, map the hard X-ray radiation coming out of the Z-Pinch chamber and to see if there was a pattern or if it favored a certain direction. Um, you're going to have to just hold with me. I threw a lot of pictures because I did a lot of pictures from Rainer. So this was from Top of Mount Rose. You see Lake Tahoe off in the distance. That was good fun. Reno. Um, this is the outside of the Nevada Terrawak facility that we got to see every day. It might be a little walk boring to the eyes, but then you turn around and you see that. So, not too bad. Um, this is the Z pinch. It was originally thought to help along with the fusion, nuclear energy. Um, at the far end, where the railing is, you'll see the Mark's capacitor banks. In the, mid, in the middle is the intermediate storage, and then at the end is the chamber and the vertical transmission line. So this is the Mark's capacitor bank, holds about 32 capacitors. Um, this is where the firing first starts. Uh, the capacitors are charged in parallel. They are then uh, switched into a series alignment and then fired into the intermediate storage, which is section. Um, there it's, this is the power amplification stage of the Z-Pinch, and water is used as the dielectric. Capacitors are also kept in a foil. And at this end is the chamber that we placed our wires in the X configuration. We take along with uh, Ben Hamill, who's doing a separate campaign, and we're just kind of luckily take down to him. In the chamber, um, we place our analog cathode with a, our X bench, which is a, a little bit different of the configuration, so um, I'll explain that a little bit later. They are currently working on moving it up and back, back and down. Um, at this chamber, it experiences about a million amps current, and this is from this equation. Um, Z pinch. It'll discharge in about 100 nanosec nanoseconds, approximately. So that's where we get the million amps. Um, it costs about two thousand dollars per shot, where Alexandria is about a quarter million dollars per shot. So, okay. relatively low cost. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think Tim's there. Hey, Tim. Sorry. Hey. Hello. Uh, hey, Nick. Keep See going. Um, this is a little blurry, but it's a uh, second floor safety control. Let me, let me switch off the phone here and see if you guys can, can hear me on the... Can you guys hear me there? We can hear you. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, this guy? Yep. This is where we lock down the facility and put it into red status and stuff. This is where I spent my time as I was um, setting up uh, data collection for Ben on the second floor. This is the control down below the Z pinch. Um, this is Oleg, and during one of the shots, this is the, our wires in the chamber. When we were putting them in, the green laser was just for focusing with them. And so. two different types of wire. We used a 35 micron tungsten and 20 micron palladium. And to give retrospect, your average human hair is about 50 micron. But me and Alex got to thread these through these little tiny holes, so that was good fun to compare to see them. But uh, this top one is the anode, which is made out of copper. It ranged from four millimeter to one millimeter in thickness. 
and the bottom is stainless steel. Um, so Ben's camp name was um, shock physics. So, along with them. Um, that's open chamber. Um, so this was after a shot. But for the plasma part, as the current comes through the wires, um, the wires ionize and create the plasma. Um, the wires with the high amperage um, begin to disintegrate and they dis disintegrate where they touch each other first. Um, this creates an infinite resistance and any electrons still trying to come through the system and the collapsing of the plasma on itself in these two cones is what creates the shock wave that is then driven through the anode, which created that hole, and the indent on the other anode. So that was the uh, Ben's campaign was determine the velocity and data on that. So yeah, that was a uh, two millimeter copper. Um, this was the optics lens above that we were used to focus the visor, which is just a laser optic system that Ben was using to collect data. So we were doing a bit of damage, which is a fun part of it, I guess. Um, this is the end of the cathode after a shot, blown out of place. You remember the first picture and a lot of debris. Um, I can't remember if this one was pulled in one or not. But this is the top um, door in the vacuum, created the that vacuum. It has uh, two lenses or safety shields, I guess. And we blew through one of those on one of our last shots. So we almost um, broke the vacuum and probably got shut down by Aaron. <laughs> that didn't happen. As for our project, these are the canisters that we uh, put our films in to do the x-rays. Um, Tim came up with a VA cam, so, and then we used the PVC pipe and stuff to create a light tight seal. So when we first got there the first week before the campaign started, um, we did uh, try to do a cross section of a uh, lip and cutting out wet films and getting all these canisters ready to go so we can slow down then once it started. Um, yeah. So this would hold our lead uh, sheets and then our film and they would be placed around the chamber. Um, this is us cutting out the lead. Our lead films, which I don't know, so can't really see. But we had three holes that didn't have any lead shielding in front of them. We also had simulators that didn't really work like they expected. But uh, the middle had three layers of one millimeter lead, and then one side had one millimeter, and the other side had two. So we could compare them. Uh, this is us setting around our canisters around the chamber. Uh, we first set them up at four different distances, just offset a little bit to determine what distance was giving us the best um, film recognition of x-rays. And then once we determined the best distance, then we put three around the chamber and then one above the chamber. And as you can see, it was difficult to create holding things to get a clear shot of the chamber without any other interference or material that would affect the x-rays. But so we had a guy for some stuff, but how's that? Here's the, just the one on the other side. And then before I hand it off to Alex, I have to thank some people that made this trip awesome. Travis, or else known as Fabio. Alex and some big boulders. Um, this is kind of fine Tim or Rick. Tim is right here, and Rick is right Yeah. But they, made it, they showed us around the first week before they left, and they thought they chose us to go. It was fun.
and I'm here with Ben, uh, the one that we take along with campaign. This is serious Ben after analyzing his data, and then this is lost Ben. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, this is a snowman on the climb of Mount Rose. Yeah. This one. Rick knows I, the entire time, I just wanted to find snow, because it had been almost a month since I found snow in Minnesota, so. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably through withdrawals, we had to. It's talking through it. Yeah, 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 it's yeah. And then on the left, Darren Covington, and then on the far right, uh, Tim Darling, big thank you. They helped us and showed us around and made sure that we didn't lose any fingers. So now I will hand it off to Alex to talk more about our research. And this is him photobombing me. So. <laughs>